Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the all-in-one cloud-based e-learning authoring tool for teams. You can learn more at domino.com. That's D-O-M-I-N-K-N-O-W.com. Now, here's this week's episode. There's the music. Get your chair dance on, everybody. And there's the coffee. Oh, the coffee, yeah. Woof. No, oh, I, good morning to everybody in the chat. I need every Wednesday. Yep, yep. A nice jolt of Java. <laughs> Brent's on his seventh cup. <laughs> Not that you'd notice. Oh, yeah, it is. It's the early morning cup of Java in Phoenix where Brent needs to drink the whole pot to get ready for us. Well, you know. It is what it is. Um, whole and pot. Yeah. Uh, we have an awesome guest with us this week. Uh, Judy Sang is joining us here. Um, Judy, I don't think you've been on our show yet before, so give us a, a quick introduction to yourself, a little bit of a, a bio so that folks can get to know you. It sounds great. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. I'm Judy Sang. I am a senior instructional designer at Collegius Education, and I've been in the instructional design world for a little over five years now. Um, and I kind of stumbled into this world, which I'm realizing more and more is the case for a lot of IDs. Like we may not have even heard of the instructional design role prior to making this career change. And that was really my case. Um, I actually went to school for a master's in instructional leadership. So I wanted to be a teacher. I went through the entire program. And then, of course, at the end, there's the student teaching portion for like a month. And just one month into student teaching, I was like, I can't do this. Um, so kudos to all teachers out there. You're doing amazing work. You're incredible people. But I was not cut out for it. Um, but I knew that I wanted to stay in the content development world and stay in the education world to help people improve their lives, whether it be their personal lives or just uh, progress in their careers. So I uh, came upon instructional design and just jumped right into it. And thankfully, it has been working out. Very awesome. Yeah, we we often hear, you know, people come into this this uh, industry sideways. You know, they they were doing something else and they get moved over to being a trainer or something. Or or uh, and, and the other wisecrack I often make is that there's no instructional designer table uh, at the career day when you're back in high school. It's not not a thing that anybody knows about until yes. sudden, sudden suddenly. Oh, w we do that. Oh, this is a whole career that I could have. Yeah, very cool. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. Um, so we're talking today about accessibility um, and universal design uh, for learning. Um, maybe just give us a little glimpse into you know how how this became a, a something that you were really strongly interested in and, and, and focused on. Where did you know where did your interest in this start? Uh, we actually started because of we saw the need increasing. Um, so our company had helps higher ed institutions develop online courses. So it could be higher ed courses, or we can be helping develop corporate programs for different corporate uh, corporations. And we did see in like the recent years, the need has increased. And it's not so much that need has increased more so of the awareness has yeah. been increasing and frankly like lawsuits have been increasing <laughs> so a lot of like higher institutions were getting sued like left and right for not having accessible content right um so that's kind of the premise of how we started looking into it a little bit more because accessibility originally was just a nice to have and now it's becoming like a must have. Um, so that's how we got started into it. And we started learning a lot more into it. And it's a very easy topic to become very passionate about um, because who doesn't want to create a course that all of the students can access and a course that all of your students can learn from with minimal barriers. Um, so we started out looking into just ADA compliance. So we just want to make sure that we can help our partners create learning materials so that they won't get a lawsuit. Um, and then we started learning more and more about just like accessibility features in general. And then we started learning about universal design. Um, 
and now like universal design is the one that you want to strive for, right? That's the most inclusive to, um, uh, kind of level in creating inclusive content. So that's really where it started. And I can um, kind of, I, I know I'm going to be throwing around the terms accessibility and universal design a lot. So I was hoping I could take a minute to kind of define those and sure. how I view them. Um, and I'm going to be using the example that a lot of people have heard about with the ramp and the stairs um, example. Um, and I also want to add in a term uh, accommodation to that level. So there's accommodation, accessibility, and then universal design. So how I have viewed these three sections, uh, three levels, and how they become more and more inclusive as it goes towards universal design is if you haven't heard of that example of the ramp and stairs scenario before i want you to imagine a platform with some stairs leading up to it so at the accommodation level um, you might see someone who is in a wheelchair who needs to go up on that platform so to accommodate for them you would go and assist that individual up that platform right they might need to ask for help or you might just see that they need assistance and you accommodate for that need um, and then the next level up for accessible design, um, you might see the scenario where there is a ramp built next to the stairs. So that way the individual who is using the wheelchair can go ahead and wheel themselves up. They don't have to ask for anyone's help. They can be independent in that. And anyone who can just walk up the platform using the stairs can go ahead and utilize that. But something I want to point out is in that scenario, there are still two different tools being used to achieve that final outcome. So um, they're still not using the same tool yet. And that's where universal design comes in. So in that same scenario now, with the platform, you might not see the case with the stairs anymore. Uh, you'll just see that ramp. So everyone, whether they're using a wheelchair, wheeling themselves up, or someone who can just walk up the ramp, they're utilizing that exact same tool to achieve that outcome. So you can see how that is the most inclusive design. Um, and then when you want to bring it back to how it can relate to course components, I'll give the example of a video. So if you have a video in the course, in the accommodation section, you might see a video that has no captions, no transcripts, just a video for students to look at. And then you might have someone who is hearing impaired and has to reach out to the instructor or the trainer and say, hey, can I have a transcript so I can understand what is going on in this video? They would provide them that transcript and you have accommodated for that need. Then the next level up for the accessible or uh, level, you might see something where the video, no caption is provided, but now you have a downloadable version of that script below. So individuals who need it can access it without asking anyone for help, um, but they just have access to it, but they are still utilizing a different tool to access that information. And then finally, for the universal design uh, level, you would see a scenario where that video is now has captions now. So everyone can utilize that same tool, whether you're, uh, whether you, you're, uh, you have a hearing impairment, or you don't have a hearing impairment, you can go ahead and utilize that tool. And um, access that same information and learn from it. Um, and then you can, it's not to dissuade you from adding like maybe a transcript at the bottom too for people to download, um, but universal design is just making sure that the main tool that you use to present information is the most inclusive one. And then everything mm -hmm. you kind of add afterwards is a bonus. Um, so as we learned about the different levels, it's, it's kind of a no brainer to be like, yeah, universal design is really the one you wanna strive for because it helps the most students. Yeah. Oh, and, and that, that example of, of the video, um, I mean, there are a lot of folks who don't have a hearing impairment who still watch TV with the captions on because the room is, is busy or, or, you know, my daughter does uh, that. It, it yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's a whole different story about, uh, <laughs> about parent and child relationships and generations and, uh, get off my porch. No. Um, <laughs> but, but still, um, we, we think about it as a, you know, adding closed captioning as a tool to assist some people. And in, sometimes we have kind of a, a narrow vision of who those folks are, but a tool like that ends up being something that brought people, you know, more broadly can simply use. And it turns out to be beneficial to everyone, uh, potentially, not just solving something for a specific group of people who may have been identified as the, you know, the, 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 the targeted need, et cetera. So. Yeah. And, and for individuals who may, uh, think that their courses are or those like universal design principles are only helping a certain population. I want to challenge you to think of how you have benefited from universal design principles in your everyday life, right? Because universal design principles actually stemmed from architecture. So if you have used an escalator, an elevator, 
walk through automatic doors or use like door handles that are levers versus door knobs or just like push a stroller up like one of those slope curves. I mean, you have benefited from something that has been created mm -hmm. based off of universal design. Um, and you might not have, you've taken it for granted, right? You didn't think that that actually stemmed from an accessibility need. So we just want to replicate this experience and replicate all of these benefits in the online learning platform. So that's something like we have to kind of uh, help people understand that it's like, yes, it really does benefit everyone. And if you don't believe me, um, you are benefiting <laughs> benefiting from it too. <laughs> it reminds me of, I'll, I'll, I'll throw in a book that I think everybody should read. I, I mentioned it to uh, a, a group I was training on Monday. Um, the Design of Everyday Things is still one of my favorite books by uh, Don Norman. Do Norman? Is Norman? Donald mm. Norman? Nielsen, Nor the Nielsen Norman group. Um, Dr. Norman is the guy that wrote it. Don Norman, thank you. I mean, I knew somebody in the chat would help me out there. Uh, it is, it's a fantastic book. It's an easy read. It's short. And, but his whole point in when you mentioned, you know, industrial architecture and stuff like that, he wrote that book well before the internet and whatnot. And he talks about doors and you know, how that for so long they were so poorly designed for not what the function was they would do. They would, they would be designed for aesthetics and not actually for function. And then they had to kind of go through that whole process. So and it's a great book. If anybody's looking for a good one to read, to catch up on that kind of stuff, it's a, it's a fun one. Now there's tons of them out there. Cause it's such a, it's such a mm -hmm. big, 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 you know, topic. Everybody is, uh, is doing research and there's a, a lot more uh, involved in it. But back then he was kind of a, he was the pioneer back in the day. Thank you very much. Um, and I've tossed a link to the uh, to the website for the book in case anybody's Excellent. interested in following up on that. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I mean, so how do we, you know, the, this idea then of universal uh, design, um, what are some of the things that we need to start doing to start thinking about that in terms of, say, you know, e-learning and online learning in, in general? Where do, where, where do we take that then to our specific sort of area of work? Um, first off, just the process of course design. So a lot of people who are hesitant on starting to look into this a little bit more, like if you talk to them about universal design, everyone is going to agree that it's like, yes, mm -hmm. this is the goal. But why there is still some hesitancy and why there are some people who are still aren't implementing it is because they might think of it as like an extra step in their course development process. So they might think that it's like, oh, after I design this entire course, and then I have to go back and make some areas more accessible or add in more resources to make it more inclusive. And I would want to have everyone reshape their thinking again to just start off with the intention of creating a very inclusive course. So that way it becomes the blueprint of everything that you are creating, right? So then you're selecting materials that are the most inclusive. You're organizing your course to be the most inclusive it can be. And you're already thinking of evaluation methods that are the most inclusive. So that way, when you finish your first initial product, that's already like the most inclusive so you can make it and then if you do if you need to make any edits then you can but at least that initial product is already very inclusive so first off just thinking about that where you just want to start off being inclusive inclusive. And then if you don't really know how, like if you haven't done too much research into universal design, a safe bet is just have multiple, like a variety of modalities for students to retrieve information and to express how they've learned the information. Um, because a lot of the times when we think about it, um, we might think of providing multiple modalities for how to retrieve it. So we might provide videos, articles, and we, we're good at that. But some people kind of forget that we need to provide multiple ways for students to demonstrate that they've learned our materials also. And I want to provide a very simple example of that where you might think um, you want or you might want to utilize a paper as an evaluation method. And then there's a student in your class that is wondering if they can just record an audio, like oral presentation of the materials instead. And you're like, yeah, you know, I only want you to be able to recite like what you've learned and apply it to like this case study. So of course, yes, you can do that. So an easy way to make that into a UDL type of evaluation is offer that to everyone. Mm -hmm. So everyone has that option. You can write a paper or you can do an oral presentation of the content. Obviously that's not going to work for all types of evaluation methods, um, 
uh, because it depends on what you are trying to measure, sure. right? So it depends mm -hmm. on the content. If you are just going to measure their knowledge on this topic, then it shouldn't matter whether they orally present it to you or if they write it um, and present it to you in a textual format. Um, if you are strict and you require them to do that textual format, then you need to start questioning yourself. Like, well, am I evaluating them based off of their typing skills? Um, so we want to make sure we're evaluating based off of that objective. Yeah. And that's one way that you can kind of frame how you are developing your course to just have a fictional character or fictional person in your mind that may need different abilities from the average student. And if you're building all of your components based off of like this individual's possible needs, then you have a better chance of covering all the bases then. So I think that's a good place to start off with just to think because it's um, when we think of like uh, individuals with uh, different abilities, we might think of percentages and statistics and that it, then you stop thinking of that individual student. Um, and I also want to bring up a case where I read before when I was reading about all, all these like lawsuits coming up, there was an individual who just had wanted to go into college like or a university and they were looking up at all of these different websites and none of them were accessible. So that individual actually ended up suing 50 universities and colleges because they couldn't access the, the websites. Um, I, and this is just something we take for granted. Like all they want to do is further their education and they're met with so many obstacles. So if you keep that person in mind, even if you think you're doing like extra steps to make your course more inclusive, hopefully you'll think it's worth it if you are going to helping even just one student. So I think it's a lot of it is just framing your mindset and then just to start off with um, just having a lot of varieties of materials. And then again, if you want to go a little bit deeper into how you can make it inclusive, internet has a lot of like um, resources and examples. Like this is something that everyone is trying to be better at. So I do not discourage like doing like a quick internet research, see what options are out there already, see what people are already doing. You don't need to recreate the wheel. You can just kind of see what they're doing, customize it to fit your needs. Um, so I think that's a really good place to start off with. I even thought about assessments. Uh, until you just mentioned it, oddly enough, I, I, I always think about the content, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and the teaching part and that, um, yeah, that's something I'm going to have to think through a lot more, uh, now because yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, if we're talking about all of our content being accessible, those, how we assess folks it is a big part of it, obviously in mm -hmm. the work that we do. So yeah, I mean, that's, mm. uh. Uh, it's definitely an interesting thing to think about on top of just how do we get the content to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Tisha has a comment in the, in the chat. Assume that you have users and students with these needs, despite what leadership thinks. Uh, I like that. Yeah, I think the last part of there is, is the, the point that's being the, trying to be emphasized that, um, yeah, there are, there are always going to be assumptions that are made about who the audience is. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, the needs that we have for, for different levels of accessibility, uh, et cetera, are, are, are hidden. We, we don't even know that, uh, you know, certain uh, things exist. Um, Brent and I are both um, moving into the middle portions of our uh, lives on this planet. And, you know, we're, we're, we're reaching for our reading glasses more and more. So there, there you know, there are all kinds of, um, you know, all kinds of things that, that uh, we would make assumptions about, ne not necessarily recognizing things. Um, when you're talking about keeping these folks, in, uh, you know, in, in mind, is your, is your group working with, like, do you have actually personas or do you have um, in checklists to, to represent the, the you know, the, the, the different range of, of, of needs? Uh, like, how do you guys approach that? We actually, when we created our ADA team, we, um, and I'll give a little quick little background of how, how mm -hmm. our ADA team formed. Oh, cool. Um, so... Once we discovered that there was a need, they had me spearhead this initiative to try to create a team to be like experts for our company. And I was, I made sure to find people from different departments that were all involved in our course development process. So I wrote, I would represent the content development team. And then I pulled individuals from, uh, or an individual from the engineering team, someone from the production team, uh, someone from video team, I say that already, hold on, engineering production video uh, and student support team. 
Um, so I made sure to pull in people from different perspectives, different levels of ec uh, areas of expertise so that we can do research in our specific areas. Um, and then that was one of the first steps where we were identifying like what type of uh, students would be most affected um, based off of like if we don't do certain things to our courses. So first we did research on like what are the common types of disabilities that are in um, that that people would face and then which are the common ones that are going to be most affected in our online courses. So we did have that research that went into it and then we went into our own separate expertises to research into that. And that's why I wanted to cover a little bit about the team effort mm -hmm. in this episode also, because if I was the only one doing research about this, the research would not be as extensive. Like I would just focus on like content development, maybe some video. I would not even be able to touch like engineering or like production, um, but have Having all these people in your team uh, bring back the knowledge, and then we all came back with our research. We educated each other on, and we presented our little what we our findings, and then we brought that back to our own little team. So I brought it back to my content development team. They brought it back to the video team, engineering team, and then the knowledge just kind of just uh, organically spreads throughout the company. And now, when we have that whole process of developing a course. Um, we have people keeping an eye out for what we can make accessible throughout the entirety of the course. Because again, if I was the only one doing it, we would kind of be at the beginning, right? We would be at the beginning of the entire course development process. And we're like, all right, content development, this is what we've got. But now we've got people double checking going like, hey, you have a, a hyperlink that's just a URL. You need to have a descriptive name mm -hmm. for it. Um, and now we have people in the video team going like, hey, we need to add like captions. So it's not just on one person's responsibility. It's a whole team effort. Everyone is looking into it. Um, and that's what we, uh, how we had started. And it, it also helps because we don't have like, uh, we didn't actually create personas. We just had the list of what are some common abilities that we should be able to address. And then it also helps having the different perspectives because then uh, what I think may be more prevalent in students taking online courses. So for someone else, they'd be like, well, someone else who has this disability may be taking it also. So that way we just cover our bases a lot more. Mm -hmm. I, I like the idea too, that it's the, the responsibility is spread across more than one person. So there isn't an official, I, I don't know, you know, accessibility um, editor or something uh, because it, 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 also breaks down the barrier, I would say, of, of seeing that as um, a, a, a nuisance step in the process or, oh, now it's going to come back from the accessibility and we have to rework everything. It, that, that potential anyway of, of conflict in, in, in understanding the, the importance and value of it. Um, and then also, we, you know, as we were chatting in, in, in the green room before we went live, this is such a broad area of, uh, of knowledge and understanding that there's probably no way that that one one person can can have it all anyway uh you know you have to be fluent in video and, and enough to be able to understand uh how to you know to implement uh some of these things in video if you're if you're not a video person per se then you don't really know what you're talking about in that sense so being able to break it down into into um silos but in the positive way of silos connected silos or whatever but but spreading that knowledge across means that everybody gets to make sure that they're coming from an area of expertise too rather than simply saying well the list says we have to do this exactly and it's helpful to have these people too because sometimes something that i think would be like oh well this would be nice to have but it seems really complicated they can be like it's actually not <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. so all of a sudden like things become more doable um and then i also want to share like it doesn't have to be i know like not all institutions have something like ours where we kind of break it up into a production line to create a course i've heard a, a higher ed institution where they were trying to uh, implement accessibility training throughout their institution also and they don't have like this kind of production line thing but when they were creating their accessibility training um, they also picked individuals from different departments but these departments were department of studies now so they okay. would find a go-getter from the history department the psychology department uh physics department they find the go-getters of each department 
give them that training and then they would give them like a little badge or certificate afterwards saying like you're an accessibility or universal design expert now and then now it was their job to go back to their teams and recruit two more individuals to come take the training so it was like a pyramid scheme for accessibility <laughs> and universal design uh training um but it, they said it worked out very well because first there was that incentive, right? They would get that badge or certificate. And then there was also kind of like a light peer pressure and fear of missing out um, because now there's people in their department that have taken this training and they're like, well, when is it my turn? And it's like, well, they got this training. So now they're actually anticipating and they're looking forward to this training versus being like, oh, well, this is like something that's being imposed on us. Um, so that's just another way that I uh, have learned has been successful. Again, it's just like a team effort. It's spread out across different departments, uh, spread out across the institution. So it's not any like single department's job to kind of enforce on everyone. When you when you first started doing it, um, how hard was it to get buy in, right? And to get the get that process started. And for those people in the um, that are with us today in the chat that are thinking about doing this. Maybe some details around how do you present it to, you know, your executive staff or just to your manager? Like how much time did it, did you devote to it to get started, to get each one of those team members in? Cause they always ask that, right? Like, well, I'm, I'm not going to give you an engineer for, you know, more than 30 minutes every month, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, give us a, give us kind of a structure of what that looked like to kind of help others get the ball rolling. Absolutely. Thankfully, we didn't have to kind of get executive buy-in. It actually came top down because we saw this need. Um, but how we started out was an hour to meet up because in the beginning we need to kind of lay down the reasons for why we're doing this, our goals, and we kind of discuss that and set that all uh, together as a team. So in the beginning, the meetings were an hour long, and then later on, maybe it can be cut down to like um, half an hour or so, or s more spread out, but it was an hour long each week. So we would just have a time, an hour for each week. And then as we uh, learned more and had less to share, because we're just kind of doing our own work and it's like thinking of how we can implement in the courses, we don't have to meet yeah. up as a team as much anymore. We might meet up like once every two weeks for an hour. Okay. Um, so that's how we kind of structured it. So buy-in, we didn't have too much of an issue in our own company, but since we do work with partners to develop these courses, what we're seeing is it's actually a lot harder to get um, partners where their institutions aren't really backing this to create inclusive content. Mm -hmm. Because if their institutions don't have a culture of trying to embrace accessibility in their courses, us coming in and trying to have them create it is very hard, right? Um, a lot of the reasonings and challenges that we've seen um, come up from SNEs and course authors is they say that there's a lack of time lack of knowledge, lack of support and clarity from their institution, and then just lack of incentive. So we might have the SMEs that come in with no institutionalized support and then are just like, we're not doing anything if they're not telling us to do this. Mm -hmm. But then we also have the SMEs who um, don't have the inst institutionalized support, but are like, well, we want to do the right thing, but they don't know enough about it, right? So they would have to take time and we would provide resources for them. Um, to learn about it, but then they would need to take time out of their course design timeline to learn about it. Um, so a lot of the times that gets dropped off because they're like, sorry, we're just trying to make this deadline and I just need to create it this way. It's like, maybe I'll learn it for like a future course. So there's that scenario. And then there's a scenario where the institution wants you to create accessible um, content, but they did not provide enough clarity around it or provide enough mm -hmm around it. So I would definitely say as you are starting to say, say you've convinced your executive leaders that this is important to implement, one main thing is to have an institutionalized policy um, that we are going to do this moving forward and have very clear guidelines. So you can even assign roles like course authors, you are going to be uh, responsible for creating um, accessible content in terms of Word documents, video files, audio files. Lay it out so that they know it's on them and they're not like, oh, well, I didn't know that was my job. I thought it was going to be someone else that's like proofreading and they'll like, um, 
magically make it accessible or something like that. So we have to define those roles and then also have a clear implementation plan too that offers training in the beginning. Like I would I would not suggest having the training be during when they're creating that content or mm. developing a course because again they the time just kind of fights against each other. So you can do something where it's like before you sign up to create a course, you have to take this um, accessibility training or universal design training. Um, so have a set aside time that is just dedicated to training. Um, so once they have that down, you can also uh, provide them with a checklist of very clear guidelines of what they need to do. So it's like Word documents. You have to have headers. You have to have alt text for images. You have to have a table headers. Just very clear your checklist, which is what actually what our team was able to do and we found very useful too. So we created checklists for every component that we think would be seen in a course. So we have checklists for Word documents, PowerPoints, Excel, video, audio, formatting. And then so that anyone who's interested, we can just like, oh, here, here Here's what you need to do to at least be compliant, right? So, because our level right now is just be compliant. And then if you want to go further, we can provide you with a lot more resources then. But let's get you compliant first. Um, so just having very clear guidelines. And I think another thing um, that is typically missed out is just letting uh, people know what tools there are to be utilized. Because they're, uh, like we said, accessibility isn't a new topic. A lot of big companies have been looking into accessibility for a very long time. And there's a lot of features that are built in tools already that you are probably using every day. Like a lot of video streaming platforms have auto caption features now. Um, there's web conference uh, platforms that offer live transcription in it. Um, there's some that I saw where it's like live translation options now. It's like that's like a whole different Crazy. level. Yeah, it's like <laughs> I can speak in English and my my listener can be like reading the uh, subtitles titles in Spanish. It, it's incredible. Yeah. And I know a lot of the Microsoft tools have like accessibility checkers. Um, so you just do like a quick search on the internet, just like type in your tool and then just accessibility features and you can probably learn a lot. Um, so that can definitely be part of the training and offering to the individuals who are going to be creating uh, the courses. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the training portion of how you can start. And then I think the culture behind accessibility really has to be embraced at companies for it to be really successful too. So even if it's just like, oh, um, celebrating the awareness month and like raising awareness throughout the company and taking a poll from the team on what they want to see improved in the courses to just include the engagement of everyone on the team, uh, team so that they feel like they're a part of this initiative and they can contribute to it. And I think that will definitely help the buy-in component. Um, pretty much the goal is just don't make it sound like it's a very complicated and like intimidating process. Just make it seem like this is what needs to be done. This is what we want to do. And let us know if you have any questions. Um, and then just, of course, provide support. Mm -hmm. And building it into the process rather than um, uh you know, uh, as part of the as the part of the flow of the development work, as opposed to simply saying, "Boom, thou must uh, you know adhere to this at at the end." Or uh, I was going to say, yeah, at the end when the, when the <clears throat> development's all done, then have your accessibility team review it. No, 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 no. Yeah. Start from the beginning. You know, it's kind of like I mean, we complain about that, right? And so we should be sensitive to it because we always hate it when when uh, when the when the product team or the implementation team does all the work and they get ready for implementation and then they scratch their head and go, Oh yeah, we should probably involve the training team. And then they, and then they're like, how come you didn't involve us from the beginning? Kind of the same thing we should be doing. We should be involving accessibility folks from the very beginning in the work that we do, not just trying to bolt it on at the end for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah. if it's, Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, um, you go ahead with your thought. I'm just going to read the, the something just popped up into the question. That's what I was reacting oh, to. Sorry. Okay. Oh, really quick. I just want to say uh, to make it less daunting too, you can also implement it in like phases. So it's like maybe the first phase is just we're going to make all Word documents accessible. Then the next phase, we're going to start tying in like videos and other components. So take it in like bite sized chunks. Mm -hmm. It's like, yes, it'd be great if you can get, and get it all done at once, but doing a little bit of time is good too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so a great tip. Russell has a question in, in the chat here, and I'll read it out. Since there are different types of disabilities for motor skills, sight, and hearing, our firm tried universal accessibility development, but received feedback from learners that the all-in-one type of training was more cumbersome 
than just providing a text version of the material? How do you, how do you overcome that feedback? I would, I would hope that um, even though that you have provided that universal design portion, you can also just provide a textual uh, option too. So if they want to go ahead and take that, they can absolutely do so. Um, I would be interested in learning more about like, what were they finding that was cumbersome? Mm -hmm. Is it like, is it, not the content itself, is it just the tool that is being used? I would definitely want to learn more about what they're finding cumbersome and hopefully we can tackle that then. Yeah. I mean, even just providing the additional, you know, the PDF, which we would traditionally see as the accommodation level and not necessarily uni universal design, but that meets a different kind of a need. I'm thinking about um, uh, one member of our team, actually, who was uh, working on his university degree while he was working with us. Um, and he would actually download his lectures and listen to them as audio files as he drove, uh, rather than because uh, he, some of his pro pro uh, courses were, were you know video based but online, because he wasn't intending in per attending in person, he would run the audio file you know so that he would be using that other time. So we, we don't think of that as um, necessarily an accessibility, but it was his way of accessing um, you know the content, the information, in a way that was was better suited to what you know his lifestyle and his needs. So. Mm -hmm. That was actually something that we started recommending to some of our partners who have adult learners. So we were like, if you really need to have a lecture, normally we try to do like shorter videos, right? But if you really want a long lecture, at least provide an audio file of it so your learners can just play it while they're washing the dishes, mm -hmm. while they're driving on their commute. Um, so I think that's a really great addition. Yeah. yeah I think it's, I think it's an important thing too. And it, um, you know, when you're looking at that creating, multi-purposing some instruction, right? Especially when you're talking about education, but there's lecture stuff still in, in corp on the corporate side of things too. Understanding ahead of time and telling your subject matter experts, if they're the ones teaching or whoever the instructor is, that letting them know that, hey, we're also going to be making just an audio only version available. So if you start pointing to things in your presentation during the class, please make note of that and and try to explain what it is that you're pointing to so that people either know oh i need to go back after i get out of the car you know when i get home and look at the powerpoint to see what they were talking about or you know they just get a better idea of of what's going on so i, I think there's a there's a lot of that education that needs to happen not just on the development side and the instructional design side but instructors need a little bit of coaching uh, subject matter experts, you know, every everybody along the way needs a little bit more information and, and can do things a little bit differently, you know, knowing that we have the ability to do so much and to multi-purpose different media types. Mm -hmm. or, to, or if it's just speak clearly, right? We're going to get this transcribed, right? Try to enunciate your words so that when we send this off to the transcriber or the translator, you know, it's easy for them. They're not coming back to you going, I'm sorry, at, at, at you know, eight minutes and 35 seconds, you mumbled something and we can't quite figure it out, you know? <laughs> Yes, exactly. And there's always a learning curve in the beginning. But once you get the hang of it, hopefully people will realize it's actually not that hard and it can become like second nature to you. And as you're developing courses, it's just kind of become the foundation of how you create courses. So like now that now that I'm aware of all of this, when I create Word documents, it's so easy to plop down the actual headers um, and just create alt text. It's just second nature now. So hopefully everyone can reach that level and they'll stop thinking of it as like, oh, I still have to learn more about this or this is just like an extra thing I have to do. Um, but yeah, that's that's the goal. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so thinking about where, where your, your team is at right now, um, I mean, you've got uh, you know, your multifaceted kind of approach. Um, everybody's got their area you know, of expertise. Um, are there still things that your team needs to add on to to your toolbox that you that you're looking forward and saying, OK, we're here. What do we need to do next? Yes, we are working on. So we've created a checklist right now, right, that we kind of hand to clients if they need it. We are also creating a library of modules that do step by step instructions on how to make these hmm. uh, areas uh, accessible. So we have included uh, some like instructions for just words like so how do you add alt text step by step instructions on that and then it covers a lot of the basics of it and then also goes into more of in depth like a well, like some people might think like above and beyond type of aspects um, so that is definitely our next step in like we, we've created a good amount of it we're just 
wanting to finalize it in our library and hopefully be able to present it to clients like, oh, do you, are you interested in making your courses accessible? We have a whole like resource for you that you can leverage. Um, and then even when that's done, there's always more you can do and there's always more you can learn about and even now and this is again another great reason why you should uh have the whole team involved in this because now even like we've kind of slowed down on like meeting up together because we're just writing our own instructions for um our areas um anyone who just sees something in the news pop up or see this new tool that they've discovered they'll go ahead and share it with the team so it's like again if i wasn't looking at that article i wouldn't see it but now that like someone is out there looking at it um all of us get to gain on that knowledge um and plus like our our team has really embraced the accessibility so again like our whole like all of our teams are kind of looking out for it now so we can always share ideas and then we'll always be updating that library like that will never be done it's a a good ideas work is never done and i think that's <laughs> a a great place for us to to start wrapping this up and yeah uh, just one last thing to throw in, I guess, uh, from the question panel, Russell's asking, is there a specific tool or group of tools you recommend to test for accessibility to make sure it's WCAG compliant? Um, Russell, just to, to, to point you back to the chat, there's a couple of articles on our own blog uh, on the Domino website that uh, that run through some of those things. It really is a suite of tools, depending on what you're looking. There is not one single sort of Hmm, accessibility checking kind of tool and every area that you do something in there, there are different uh, different things to be aware of. But I know that at least uh, two of the links uh, that I have uh, shared previously in the chat today um, have that. Speaking of sharing in the chat, Judy, take a minute and toss your contact details where people can find you that sort of thing into the chat. Um, and uh, and folks, don't forget to, to check those out and, and connect with Judy around that. Um, and as we always say at this point in time, as we hear the music coming up, uh, we have a LinkedIn group where you can also uh, check in with us uh, uh, on various things, including today's topic. Brent's tossed that in there. So join us there in the LinkedIn group for Idiotic. Um, we love hearing from everybody and we love uh, following up with everybody. So there's the music. Let's uh, dance. We're right here. Here. Judy, yeah. thank you so much for hanging out with us and yeah. sharing everything that you've been working on with accessibility and universal design. We all need it for sure. Appreciate you. Thank, thank you, you yeah. for thanks having so, me. Thanks so much, Judy. Let's dance on out, guys. See everybody next week. I haven't done a good Zoom lately. Nothing but the best special effects. <laughs> Adios, everybody. Bye.